Greetings and salutations, everyone. My name is Ryan of Neuroculture. Welcome to another exciting episode of our interview series. Our guest this week, and for those of you who are watching us live, and if you're watching us uh, through our YouTube channel or the replay, we thank you so much for being with us. Once again, our guest tonight, she is an incredible person who has been a writer of both novels, uh, many, many novels, as well as written for some of the most popular television series over the last number of years, whether it's Star Trek The Next Generation or Odyssey 5 or Sequest DSV and more. She has been to every corner of the known galaxies. Please welcome Melinda M. Snodgrass. Melinda, welcome to the show. Hi, Ryan. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And and your audience may be in for God only knows what's going to come out of my mouth because as I was telling you, I got up at 4 a.m. this morning because I had my horses arriving back in New Mexico from California and there seems to be a law of nature that horses are only picked up and delivered in the dark. <laughs> this just seems to be what happens. Um, I've never, ever, ever had a horse, you know, arrive in daylight. So it's uh, it's just sort of where we are. So I'm I'm feeling no pain and I'm ready to talk about anything. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much for being with us. So uh, to let the audience know, if you have any questions for our guest tonight, Melinda M. Snodgrass, please leave them in the comments section. I will be monitoring that, keeping an eye on that as things go along throughout the course of the show. So I will put this little reminder for those of you who are watching us. Uh, there it is. So any questions for Melinda, please leave them in the comments as we go along. So Melinda, first question that we have here for you. What started your love and appreciation for the sci-fi genre? My father. Um, my dad read to me. He taught me to read before I went to school, first of all. And he would read to me at night to help me go to sleep. And he had picked Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. But he left out all the fish stuff and he only read the cool, exciting stuff and about, you know, this highly technological submarine, you know, and, and the mystery of Nemo. Um, and I think that started it. And then the very first book that I remember reading by myself without any help was A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Um, <clears throat> and our library, the little library we would go to, it was only in the adult section where there were science fiction books. And my mother would roll her eyes, but she would let me go in there. And it was a very tall, narrow shelf. And I started at A and I read all the way to Z. And I just read every book that was there. <laughs> um, and so from my earliest childhood, it's just been, that's the thing I've loved more than anything else. I mean, I read other things, mysteries, and but, but science fiction and fantasy have my heart and always have. Wow, that is wonderful. That is incredible. So when did you start writing novels? And then the second part of that question is, when did you start writing for television? Okay, well, um, I've had a very checkered past. It's like I couldn't figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, I used to be a lawyer. <laughs> I have a law degree. Um, and at one point I went to Europe and studied opera because I thought I'd be a great singer, but I'm kind of small for that. Um, then I went to law school. But all through this, I've loved, I did theater, um, I sang, I did ballet, I did all these things. And I was deeply unhappy in this law firm. I mean, deeply unhappy. And my best friend then at the time, um, who was a novelist named Victor Milan, he said to me, I bet you could write if you tried. And so he started kind of mentoring me which is one of the things that is so amazing about my field and about science fiction and writing in general. This is an enormously generous group of people and everybody pays it forward. So Vic would read my chapters as I wrote in secret and give me notes and hopefully I got better as you can continue to get better. Um, and so eventually I sold a novel uh, about a federal court judge writing circuit in outer space in near earth orbit. Um, always drawn on your background and what you've studied. And so that was sort of the beginning of the novels. And what was interesting is my mother then reminded me years after I'd started selling, she said, you used to write plays for the neighborhood kids to perform in when you were a little girl. And I was like, really? <laughs> oh, I, I didn't remember doing that. So I write novels for a long, long time, and I have this circle of wonderful friends in New Mexico, people like Walter John Williams and Roger Zelazny and, and uh, Vic and all these folks. 
Um, and then a certain individual moved down to New Mexico, a uh, little known guy named George R.R. R. Martin. <laughs> And uh, George and I got to know each other and we were all in a gaming group together. We were all role players, you know, we'd play role playing games. And um, George at some point went off to Hollywood to work on the new Twilight Zone and then on Beauty and the Beast. And George called me one evening and he said, uh, hey, Snod, you know, that's his nickname for me. Thank you, George. Um, he calls me, he says, hey, Snod, I think you'd be pretty good at the screenwriting thing. And if you write a spec screenplay, I'll show it to my agent. So um, one of the things I've learned and my father taught me is you always take the shot. You always, if an opportunity is offered to you, take it, take the risk, do the thing. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna write a script. Um, and I didn't wanna write for Beauty and the Beast because I thought that would put George on the spot if it turned out I was terrible at this. Um, and I didn't want to do LA Law because it looked really complex. And Next Generation had premiered. And I thought, um, I grew up on Trek when I, from the time I was a little kid. And I thought, well, I'll take a look at it. Um, so I did, I watched a few episodes and I found the character Data to be fascinating. So I wrote a script about Data and the question of whether he is a person or the property of Starfleet Command. It's called The Measure of a Man. Um, and again, I couldn't have written that script if I hadn't been to law school because it's based on an infamous Supreme Court decision called Dred Scott, uh, where it was ruled that a runaway slave was not a person, but was property. So I wrote this spec script and um, George showed it to his agent and um, she liked it and sent it on to Star Trek. And they ended up buying it, and then they hired me on the show. So that's how I started my career. And I do want to back up because um, for those of you who aren't familiar with how Hollywood works, a spec script, this is sort of how it was done in the old days. You'd write a spec script for a TV show already on the air, and then um, they wouldn't send it to that show. They normally would send it to a different show because oftentimes people on the show who are writing for it go, well, that person really messed up that character. That isn't how they talk. But in this case, it went to Trek. But George explained to me, he said, you never sell your spec script. Never, ever, 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 ever will you sell your spec script. Um, it's just a calling card. So you need to prepare some pitches because if they like the script, they may have you come in to pitch some other episodes and you need to come up with some other things. And I called George and I said, look, I think I've got this really good idea, but I don't want to waste it if it's not going to sell. You know, maybe I should pick something different. And George gave me one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten. And he said, never hoard your silver bullet, meaning lead with the very best thing you've got. You know, never write the second best idea, write the best idea. And he was absolutely right because they did buy the script and then they ultimately hired me on the show. And so, you know, I guess when I teach um, or talk to young, young aspiring writers, I always say, first, take the risk, always take the opportunity and, uh, you know, never hoard your silver bullet because uh, you, you just never know what can happen you know, when you when you give it your best and give it your all. So so that's how I got into Hollywood was through, you know, um, networking and, and, a, and a good friend. And a good friend got me into writing novels. Oh, wow, that is amazing. So yeah, you, you write these novels, you start uh, writing some scripts for the Starship Enterprise for Star Trek The Next Generation. Now, how did you get uh, to be in a position where you were writing uh, other stories or other scripts for other series such as Odyssey 5 and especially Sequest DSV, which I hear has got a massive following and one of my friends who found out i was going to be interviewing you she was excited she was like oh my gosh let me see what episode she's written and she looked at the episodes you've written and she and she says to me wow she wrote this episode and that that is incredible so the question is how did you get uh, or how did you end up writing on those other series well once um i i did a, a se half a season and all of the third season of trek and then i went on and ended up on a lawyer show interestingly enough which was you know called reasonable doubts and then when that show was canceled, sadly, um, you know, I started doing a lot of freelance work and um, and I had friends who were, you know, on these other shows. And so a friend of mine was on Sequest and he called me up and said, uh, 
hey, you want to write a you want to write an episode for us? And um, I said, yeah, sure, that sounds great. And of course, being a science fiction fantasy kind of person, I wrote the ghost story. <laughs> I wrote the 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 ship, you know, filled with ghosts that takes them into this mysterious place. Um, and Odyssey Five was the same situation. I had um, I had written the pilot, the opening uh, pilot for The Outer Limits, and um, Manny Cato, who was then running, uh, he'd run he'd run uh, Outer Limits. He was also running Odyssey Five, and that one breaks my heart because if that show had been picked up for another season, I know they were going to hire me, and I loved that show, and I wanted to write for it so badly. Um, but I did get to write that one episode, and uh, and it was it was a ton of fun. But the show only lasted one season, and uh, which I found to be very disappointing. You know, I think it could have really been um, an amazing ride. And then the only other sort of weird offbeat show. I mean, I've done a lot of weird <laughs> offbeat shows um, episodes, but uh, was Strange Luck, um, which was a show on Fox, I think, that lasted a season. Me, and uh, you know, it, it, that was a fun. But again, it's it's often the networks, it's who you travel with and who you get to know. Um, and all of those, those contact, contacts are important, you know, um, as, you, as you grow into your, your, your field, whether it's novels or, or writing for television, actually probably for almost anything, you know, networking is pretty important, so. Yeah, that is, that is absolutely true. I've seen uh, my fair share of TV series I've come to enjoy over the years, and some of them only have lasted, you know, one, two, maybe three seasons, if they're lucky, you know, depending on the circumstances of what's going on behind closed doors or the ratings just aren't there and they have to remove it, they have to cancel it, all that stuff. Like, I've seen some good, or like, good adaptations or sci-fi shows canceled over the years, and I'm so, there's a little part of me that's still upset. Uh, why would you cancel, you know, insert show name here? It's like, why? why we needed another season there's so much you could have done with these characters and some of these certain storylines that could have really have grown and you could have shown more development in certain circumstances but you know what you know there for the most part most of our favorite shows are available whether it's through a streaming service or whether it's through other means such as physical media whether it's dvd blu-ray i mean one of these days i'm gonna have to go back and sit down and watch a few episodes of Odyssey 5 as well as Sequest DSV because when you got Roy Scheider who tells you you're going to need a bigger boat and then he's you know <laughs> kind of running this thing and then you get the late uh, you get the late actor known as Jonathan Brandis who I remember from the never ending story uh, part two as Bastion I remember him from that as well as uh, sidekicks with the one and only Chuck Norris so uh, Jonathan Brandis rest in peace uh, good sir gone too soon but uh, next question for you this is a big one too. What are some of your favorite sci-fi movies or TV series? Oh God, all right. Well, one of my all-time favorite sci-fi TV shows is Person of Interest, which I think is one of yes. the most brilliant shows that's ever, ever, ever been made. Um, and that's one where I deeply wanted it to go on more than this, you know, the five, the four and a half years that it had. Um, I love that show. I, I think it was extraordinary. Um, the Magicians has has just been uh, a knockout. Um, I, I'm just so disappointed that it, they just decided that it ended so abruptly. I mean, I think there was so much more to tell. Um, well, then there's all the Star Wars shows. Uh, I love Clone Wars. Um, the Mandalorian is amazing. I love Rebels. I think Rebels inches out Clone Wars for me just because I, I find the character so appealing. Um, and, uh, you know, there's just, there's so much to choose from. I mean, you know, we won, you know, we, the nerds inherited the earth, the nerds and the hooks won everything. I play video games too. So, and if you go into, to the video games, it's, it's all science fiction and fantasy. I mean, I played Mass Effect and Dragon Age and, you know, I'm, trying to get the combat figured out for Witcher 3, which is making me a little crazy. Um, but uh, um, so those are kind of my top, top, tip top favorites. Um, I'm sure that, you know, we'll come up with some more as I sit and contemplate about it. I mean, I'm really looking forward to um, Falcon and Winter Soldier and, uh, um, you know, some of the, and, and the, the show about Loki, because he's, uh, you know, although I think they're only going to get Tom Hiddleston occasionally, you know, I think they're going to have him in different forms so they don't have to, you know, pay for the big movie star. <laughs> but uh, 
but I'm really looking forward to those shows as well. Oh, yes, absolutely. And speaking of the well, two pieces I'll bring up here before we go to the next question, uh, what are your thoughts on the trailer that came out uh, for the film that supposedly is supposed to come out in December? But, you know, with the situation with COVID, wouldn't be surprised if some of these movies or other projects get delayed. What are your thoughts on the film from Denis Villeneuve known as Dune? Um, it'll be interesting to see if somebody can get their arms around it. I mean, you know, everybody keeps trying. It's it's such a big book. I mean, I liked the trailer, what I saw of it, and um, you know, I'm certainly going to be there to see it um, and watch it. Um, so, you know, we'll just we'll see. I mean, um, the David Lynch Dune was just kind of weird, but you know, when when I saw it, you you sort of went. When you saw Kyle McLaughlin, you think, oh my God, that guy's going to be a huge star. You know, I mean, he, he had that much on screen presence and charisma. Um, and then there was the sci fi, they did that mini series, which was, you know, it was okay. Um, so we'll see. I mean, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but uh, I'll definitely be there to watch. I mean, obviously, I, I've read the book, and, you know, the book was, um, is, is sort of one of the pillars of, you know, one of the fundamental big science fiction novels. Of, of, of our genre, so. Yeah, definitely looking forward to seeing uh, what happens with that film, because the trailer has me intrigued. And this is coming from somebody who's not really familiar with the source material. That's why I'm more of a, don't get me wrong, I like to read my fair share of books, but I'm a bigger movie fan than I am a book fan. No disrespect to the people who put those things together and all that stuff. It's just, if I watch a movie, it's easy for my brain, for, to a certain degree, it's for it's easier for my brain to absorb. But we shall see how it goes. Now, did you hear about the latest casting of the Marvel Universe with, I believe it's Tatiana Maslany from Orphan Black is going to be playing the character She-Hulk for an MCU TV series on a uh, Disney Plus streaming service. She's going to be playing the cousin to Bruce Banner's character, played by Mark Ruffalo. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I actually hadn't heard that, so thank you for telling me because she's extraordinary. I mean, Orphan Black, what an amazing show and what an amazing actress. I didn't know it was happening. So thank you for letting me know. Um, I, I'll, I'll be watching that too. I mean, you know, I, I, I watch, I mean, I, I watch Krypton. I watch, you know, a lot of these shows because that's, um, I'm, I'm just going to be more interested in that. You know, I'm, I'm really not going to be all that intrigued by This Is Us or something, you know, or, um, not my thing, you know. If it's if it's if it's got spaceships or or uh, or swords, um, I'm more likely to watch. I mean, obviously, I watched the Witcher series, um, and uh, which I'm glad they finally got time caught up with it. I don't think they did the jumping around in time as gracefully as they might have, but uh, I ended up enjoying the show anyway. So, hmm. yeah, I've uh, I've one I. One of my plans is to eventually sit down and watch The Witcher because the lead actor, Henry Cavill, yeah. who, in my opinion, is one of the best, most just gifted, gifted actors of uh, today's film world, especially I know this film is, has its fair share of you know likes and dislikes. This movie is very divisive, to say the least. Man of Steel is one of my all-time favorite movies because of Henry Cavill and the people around him's performances. I think everybody in that film did a tremendous job, specifically Henry Cavill. And I know some people don't like it, but that's okay. You know, it, it, to each their own. But Henry Cavill, if you're watching this, you're the man. You deserve a lot more projects. We hope to see you in more. Once Earth safely reopens, I want to see you in more stuff because you're the mech. So there's my little little plug for Henry Cavill, if you don't mind my saying so. No, not at all. I, I think he's amazing. Um, I had some real issues with Man of Steel. I love the fact that they made Lois Lane a modern, competent woman. Um, that for me was one of the one of the real strengths of that film. But I'm going to mention a film that Cavill did that a lot of people haven't seen, and you should because it's fantastic. Man from Uncle. When he I have seen it. He is incredible in that movie, and the movie is a love letter to the 1960s, and it's just charming. And uh, so if you like Cavill, go watch The Man From Uncle, rent The Man From Uncle, because it's great. So um, yeah, so that's, uh, we, we obviously have very similar taste. We may have some disagreements on things, but I think we have very similar taste. Yes, yes, that's all, and yes, and that's all well and good. Yes, The Man From Uncle, I had the privilege of seeing that in the theater when it was uh, in theaters originally. Granted, it was only in theaters for two minutes, because it didn't do too well uh, when it comes to box office numbers. But you know what? 
it's about quality, not about quantity when it comes to movies. And I think Man From U.N.C.L.E. was a fun, you know, giddy spy thriller. And you got the cast is just so well put uh, put to screen. And Army Hammer and him and Cavill bickering with each other and how they go about solving the case in their own different styles is so good. And then he wakes up the next morning. He's wearing the bathrobe. But, and the girl walks out of his apartment. He's like, do these belong to you or to me? <laughs> it's just Henry... <laughs> I, he's probably not I wish he would get this job I don't know if it's possible if they're going to cast the next James Bond give Henry Cavill the job because he's the he needs to do it he was born to be a slick styling and profiling just guy as an actor and as a character <laughs> and I, I love James Bond too I'm 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 so I was I really really want to see the next Bond movie and yet you know do we go out in public? I, you know, honestly, I'm not willing to go into a movie theater right now. And I love going to the movies. So, you know, hard to say <laughs> what's going to happen. Mm hmm. Yep. No, it seems pretty timely that the name of the movie is called No Time to Die. And we're in the middle of a pandemic where we don't have no time to die because we don't want to. We don't so, want to die. <laughs> so it seems, it seems the movie is appropriately titled and put together in that sort of weird twisted way but that's just me uh the, <laughs> the next question i have for you now we were mentioning uh, some sci-fi movies and tv series now l let's play a little bit of a game here it's kind of like you know you're let's say for instance you're running the studio and you want to put together the next whether it's a series or the next uh, set of movies within a particular universe which cinematic or maybe not so connected cinematic universe would you want to run and what ideas would you have for that universe, whether as a TV series, as a movie? Well, if, if I could, um, I, I love Star Wars. Star Wars has my heart. Um, Star Wars is why in many ways I had the courage to quit the law firm and become a writer. Um, I, I just, uh, you know, when I saw Empire Strikes Back, I, thought I, I can't keep doing what I'm doing. So um, I feel in many ways like Star, Star Wars gave me my life, um, the life that I love. I would love to be involved with any of the Star Wars. And, and I'm actually really interested in less about the, you know, the sort of planets on the fringes out in wild space or, you know, the outer rim. You know, I've always wondered, you know, what is Minneapolis? What is the Minneapolis of Star Wars? You know, what is that like? Is there an Amazon? Um, you know, do they have, you know, traveling theater groups, off-Broadway things that come and, you know, everybody's saying, oh, this show is great on Coruscant. And now we're getting the third level cast coming to our planet of Minneapolis, you know, to, <laughs> to get to see this thing. And, you know, I, because I'm an attorney and my specialty was constitutional law when I was um, in law school, I'm always interested in what drives political systems and what makes people say, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy with the empire, at least for a while until it became, you know, hideous and murderous. But, you know, what drives people to seek that kind of sense of security and safety um, as opposed to, you know, giving up freedoms. And so I just think there's so much that could be played with that hasn't really been, you know, delved into yet. So that's one thing. I mean, obviously, um, I have my own <laughs> series. Uh, I, you know, I, I write books as well. And um, I've actually written a TV pilot based on one of my series of books, The Carolingian, which is present day, but it's sort of an occult thriller about the war between science and rationality and superstition and religion and magic, um, I come down on the side of science. <laughs> and uh, and then I also do a big space opera series called Imperials. And, uh, you know, I'd love to do Imperials. It would be tough because there's a lot of aliens. I mean, any aliens are essential because, again, I'm exploring the issues of how societies develop and second class citizenship and, you know, how would humans react when we, if we went out into the stars and discovered there were actually other species my 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 sad feeling is that we would become the evil invading aliens you know that we would you know rather than the other way around that we would promptly you know kick the stuffings out of anybody we met um because that's the other thing and we don't like other things you know so um so i've you know i explored that in those books and and actually my manager has been you know sort of talking it up around town and saying, yes, it would be very expensive, but if you're looking for a big science fiction series, you know, my, my client here has these books. 
Um, so, you know, I obviously I'd love to develop my own work, um, but, uh, you know, Star Wars would be number one. What else would I want? I mean, there's so many great novels This, you know, begging to be, to be it developed. Um, a friend of mine, Kate Elliott, wrote a book called Black Wolves, which is, has a very um, Asian feel and, and really great, great novel, um, but a fantasy, you know. So, you know, there's lots of things that I think could, could be, you know, there's a treasure trove out there. Um, and I would be happy to, uh, you know, mention any of them to studio people, not necessarily my own, but other people's as well. Mm, absolutely absolutely so with there's a lot of things i mean even though you know earth is kind of closed right now because the unfortunate circumstances surrounding the pandemic but when earth reopens we have a lot of movie franchises that are you know have had a few installments in their franchises already they're already out we got new ones that are supposed to come out you know soon or at least at some point in the in, in the future is there any current movie franchise or current tv series that that you would want to like say, oh, I, I, I really want to be on this current series because I feel like I can add a little bit of something, you know, a little something, something to the recipe to spice things up. Is there anything current that you're like, oh, I want to jump on this right now, like this show or this series has my attention. I want to see what I can do next. Yeah, um, I, the Umbrella Academy, um, I think is a really interesting show. Um, I would, I would not mind uh, working there. Obviously, any of the Star Wars shows, I would be, I would be lining up for it. Um, you know, I don't do zombies. Zombies kind of bore me. <laughs> you know, so any of that genre is not my thing. Um, but uh, you know, and Witcher. I, you know, now that Witcher's kind of gotten caught up in time and isn't quite as befuddling, um, I think that's a show that I, I, and also to write for Henry Cavill would be a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a there, there's just so much. I mean, I'm trying to, um, you know, there's actually an ancient British show um, that that I caught in in reruns and on DVDs um, called UFO, and I would love to update and reboot UFO. Um, it was a British show, and uh, and it, Gary Larson. And Gary Larson, I'm trying to remember. I'm sorry, I may have gotten the name wrong, but it was it was an interesting premise, and I think it just needs some massaging for a modern setting. Um, had some great characters, and um, and and a moon base, and girls wearing purple wigs, which was just awesome, <laughs> you know. And they explained the purple. They were like, "Why are they wearing purple wigs?" And it was like, "It's something about the static electricity," and mostly because it looked really cool cool and they you know they wore these great silver outfits and then need purple wigs um but i would i would love to reboot ufo um that would be a show that uh you know if i ever got the opportunity so you know um what what would you what are your favorites i mean what what are you looking at that makes you go these are these are great uh as far as far as tv series i haven't uh i'm kind of limited because I have other things that I've been currently, you know, working on, whether it's, you know, things we're doing for neuroculture or I'm, we're back in school now. So I'm taking my classes virtually. So that takes up some of my time, right. but some of the things I do watch and this show is coming to an end. So I, once the season has fully been aired, I'm going to go back and binge watch all of it. Cause I want to get all the episodes in just one sitting rather than just having to watch them by when they come out weekly. And right. that would be, and that would be CW's the hundred, which is based off the book series of the same name. It's a dystopian series where Mankind has been wiped out by nuclear war, and the surviving humans go up into a matter of a couple of spaceships, but they all come together to form what is known as the Ark. And on the Ark, they're running out of supplies many years later, so now they're trying to figure out if Earth is inhabitable again. So what do they do? They send a hundred juvenile delinquents down to Earth to test its atmosphere to see if Earth is able to be survivable, to be inhabitable again. And the kids go down, and yes, a little bit of a spoiler for season one, it is inhabitable. You can breathe. You're able to go around Earth and walk around and explore things and whatnot. But as the teenagers begin to explore this new Earth, since you know everything's been wiped out by nuclear war and things have mutated, things have changed, they realize that they are not alone. No. So things take a bit of a turn there. So it's very interesting. It's a wonderful show. I think the entire cast and crew, which includes actors such as Isaiah Washington, Henry Ian Cusick from Lost, Desmond, seeing another life brother, 
great actor, Paige Turco, who played the legendary character April O'Neil in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Part 2, The Secret of the Ooze, as well as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, Turtles in Time. Yes, those movies, folks. She's in it, as well as a whole bunch of other actors, and I think it's a great series. They are on their seventh and final season. This is the last ride, so I'm looking forward to sitting down and binge-watching it, see how it comes to its conclusion, because I've been following these characters since the very beginning, and I want to see it. I want to see how it all comes to an end. So The 100 is one of my favorites. That's something that I'm a fan of. As far as other, uh, what is it, sci-fi movies or TV series that I'm a fan of, I did watch a few episodes of Krypton. I want to go back and finish that up. I grew up watching shows such as Smallville, big fan of Smallville, which is one of the reasons Superman is my favorite superhero character. I have a deep connection to that character. Smallville got me through a dark period of my life, so I have the cast and crew to thank for that. Thank you, guys. Smallville, what else? I mean, I've watched, I mean, I'm a big superhero guy, so I've watched my fair share of Batman the Animated Series, whether it's the Dark Knight Trilogy or Tim Burton's 1989 masterpiece known as Batman, not Batman Returns. That's a Tim Burton movie, not a Batman movie. Batman 89... I can watch that movie all day long, twice on Sunday. So, yeah, those, those are just some of my few favorite things that I've watched or I'm about to watch and experience. But, yeah, I've, I've grown up on things such as Star Wars, like a lot of people have, and I love the movies. I like the franchise. I want to see where it goes next with The Mandalorian as well as other projects that I hopefully they're going to come out with. I know they have an Obi-Wan Kenobi television series coming, which I think is going to be really interesting. But, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I, um, sure. I, I write for and co-edit. Um, a series of book called Wild Cards uh, that George and I started, which is about superheroes. And I actually don't have, I was not allowed to read comics when I was a kid. So, mm. you know, this, this is something, and, and I have to be honest, you know, and, and because I was trying to get Wild Cards set up as a TV series, which we haven't actually managed to do yet. We came close, but we haven't quite managed to do it. Um, is, uh, you know, I, I, my impression is that, the Marvel universe was working way better for me than the DC universe, except on television. I mean, I do watch the CW shows, but I'm kind of like, you guys got to, gotta. I mean, other than Wonder Woman, I feel like you got to up your game on these DC movies, you know? Um, and, and some of the, some of the Fox X-Men, some of them I loved. Um, I, I, I've been very fortunate in the friends I've made. Um, one of my friends who sort of, taught me a lot about comics was Lynn Ween, who created Swamp Thing Wolverine. And, um, and, and I used to go over to his house and we would watch all the CW shows on Thursday. We'd watch Person of Interest and we'd watch the CW shows. And it was, it was both wonderful and frustrating because Lynn would pause the television on any of the CW shows and give me a lecture about, okay, now this character, he's gonna turn into a bad guy and he's gonna be known as this in a few more years. And I was like, Lynn, can we just watch the show? You know, but he had been an editor and a writer at both DC and Marvel. He knew all these characters and had been doing it since he was 18 years old. And so, um, you know, it was was really, really fun. And and, uh, I've written, I've written one graphic novel, which, you know, I'm waiting on my artist. Um, and Lynn gave me a lot of invaluable advice um, about, you know, how to craft and write and, and write for that particular medium, which is quite different than writing for novels or writing for television. Similarities to, te- to writing a script, but um, some interesting differences, too. You know? <laughs> so, and, and it was a blast. You know, you got to you don't have to worry about the budget. You could be the director and write all the dialogue and, you know describe to the artist what you wanted in the moment in the in the panels and I, I really did enjoy it. I, I've been dabbling a lot of different kinds of writing basically <laughs> in all of the years. So. Oh, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Going back just for a minute here, person of interest, as soon as I saw the trailer for that when it debuted, you know, year a few years ago, I was like, okay, this or excuse me, the premise is just phenomenal it's like okay this is different because crime dramas legal dramas they are a dime a dozen they can turn those things out so quickly but person of interest that's real like that's raw like that's stuff you don't see on television to have jim caviezel now some some of you may think this is the right analogy some of you may not and that's fine to me person of interest reminds me of a modern day batman setting where jim caviezel is batman but he wears a suit like an average everyday suit finch is the alfred he is the one behind the computer he is the one giving you know bruce a little bit of help here or bruce wayne in this or batman here and there some pointers right and then 
you know, they have the other supporting characters like Root, played by Amy Acker, who is very creepy. She's very good at playing creepy, looks like she wants to kill you, but then maybe wants to be your best friend is Root. Very creepy stuff, but excellent performance. And then you get Agent Shaw, played by, I forget the woman's name, Sarah Shahi. There it is. Oh, he and was, yeah. Shaw was incredible because she was very multi-layered. You think she's going to be on your side for one minute and then she can flip you, you know, change things on a dime. And also Paige Turco, speaking of CW's The 100, she made appearances as the political slash fixer on that show. She was Zoe, that Jim Caviezel and her had a little bit of a fling, a little bit of a love interest there. And I like that. I like the little tension that they built between you two, Jim Caviezel, Paige Turco. I see what you're doing and I like it. So yes, person of interest, ladies and gentlemen, if you have not seen this series, I don't want to spoil it for you because it's just too good. Find it on a streaming service. Buy it on DVD if you have to. I don't care. Watch the show. It's 103 episodes. It should have been a lot longer than that, by the way. But 103 episodes, it's pretty, it's pretty solid. And it has a good, complete story, even though it really could have gone on for a couple of years longer. I'm not going to lie. I mean, just the opening narration by Finch, giving you what the premise of the show is and why they're doing what they're doing. There's a machine spies on you every hour of every day. It's, well, he know because I built it. So good. So and, good. Need I, I say more? Yeah, and I will say, if any of you do haven't seen it and look it up, hang in there. For the first six episodes, you're going to just think it's a typical you know, crime drama. It's not. It's a science fiction show and a brilliant one. And, and the creator is, is Jonathan Nolan, Jonah Nolan, um, who is doing Westworld, which is a show I adore. And, um, and so he is fascinated with issues of AI. That should tell you a little bit about where you're going to be playing in person of interest. And some of the things he was thinking about and working on in person of interest are being brought to fruition in Westworld, which is another, you know, amazing television series too. So I, uh, I, I highly recommend anything that Jonah does. He's, he's great. Absolutely. And I will, I will second that just to let everyone know, if you're watching this, you have any questions for our guest, Melinda tonight, please feel free to drop them in the comments. We're going to get to them in just a short little bit. Next question I have for you here, Melinda, do you have any upcoming projects that you can tell us about whether they be novels or otherwise? Well, I'm, I'm in the process of, um, I'm, I'm getting all my books back, uh, available and two of them are out now. Um, one is a series about a young woman lawyer working in a vampire law firm in Manhattan. Um, it's the White Fang Law series. Book one, This Case is Gonna Kill Me, is available. And I have my Imperial Saga, which is my big space opera. And book one of that, The High Ground, is currently now available. And we're working at bringing out the other books. And then there are two more books in Imperials that nobody's seen that I've written, books four and five. Um, I always finish a series. I never start anything unless I know what the ending is. And I think, you know, it, it doesn't matter how great the journey is. If you don't stick the landing, it's going to be an ultimate disappointment to your readers or your viewers or your players. Um, so it's, it's very important for creators to remember that, you know, figure out what the end is, plot backwards, make sure it works. And, um, and so those are the two things I've got. I'm writing a, and then I have this Carolingian series, which is about the contemporary occult thriller. I'm working on the fourth book of that one. I'm starting to think about what to do with Imperials. Do I fill in some entry space? Do I pick up the next generation? Because it's kind of a big universe. You know, I created this sort of big, you know, future history of my own. And so I have more books to tell. Um, and... Um, yeah, you know, it's it's I've got all those and I would like to write another um another one in my White Fang Law series because I I've done something very peculiar to my heroine at the end of the third book and I kind of need to resolve it. Um and you know, I've got a fantasy novel I'm sort of toying with. Um it's starting to come into focus. I actually created If your parents tell you that role playing is a waste of your time, um, it's not. <laughs> a lot of the characters who end up in my novels have been characters that I've created in role playing games. And then I, you know, you can't just write up a role playing game because that doesn't make for good fiction. But oftentimes you can create a character that if you work with and flesh out, you can take that character and put it in something, um, either, you know, a, a screenplay or a novel. And uh, I, I played a character that 
I couldn't figure out how to get my arms around this particular fantasy novel. And I realized that I had the wrong viewpoint character and this character I had created would be the perfect one. And, um, and so it's starting to come into focus now, but life has been crazy because we're in the middle of this pandemic and I am trying to get my books out again and, you know, a lot of things going on. So I haven't really had time to outline it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, get out the cork board and the three by five cards and the multicolored pens and figure out exactly what that book is about. So yes, I am an architect. I outline everything. I don't, I don't write from the seat of my pants or as George would say, I'm not a gardener. I, I need to, I need to know that the building works and it's going to stand up. So. <laughs> Well, we wish you the best of luck with those future projects, those books, all that wonderful stuff. Next question I have for you, I know I'm backtracking a little bit here, but what is it like working with George R. R. Martin of GOT fame, Game of Thrones, among others, of course? Um, you know, George and I have been, you know, friends for more years than I want to confess. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's been, it's been great. I mean, we've had a lot of fun and, and uh, I'm forever grateful to George because he, gave me that opportunity to move into Hollywood. Um, and, you know, it's, um, and, and working on wild cards, it's really fun to get to create a sandbox. We created the universe. It's a shared world where we create, the, we created the world and then we invite other writers to come and play in the same universe. Um, but George and I, it's kind of like doing a TV show in prose um, and that we'll create an overarching plot. And then we ask the writers to pitch stories that are like the episodes that will carry the thing forward. And, and we get to use each other's characters, which it you know, makes it really fun. It's fun to see how another writer sees your character. Um, and so, you know, George is, is funny and he's kind and, and he is in fact working on wins a winner. Okay. Everybody please don't freak out. Um, you know, just, he is. Um, I'm doing a, a lot of the work on wild cards now so that George has plenty of time to work on completing, you know, his magnum opus. So, um, so that, that's sort of, you know, what I can tell you. <laughs> no, that's all, that's all well and good. Now with the situation with the pandemic, do you have any outside of writing your novels and writing, you know, potentially writing for TV, do you have any hobbies outside of that? Um, I, I do. Well, when I used to be, I'm, I'm a gym rat when I could go to a gym, which I can't now. Um, but my major hobby is, uh, is horseback riding. Um, I have two Lusitanos who are they're Portuguese horse. I'm a dressage rider. Um, and, uh, I've ridden, uh, up to, I, I ride the FEI, which those of you who don't know what that is, I don't want to give you a boring thing about dressage, but it's sort of dancing with horses. And um, I, I love it. I've ridden since I was three years old. And, um, and, and they just, you know, when I was working in LA, my horses were with me. And then I came home to escape the pandemic and the fires in California. And getting the horses home has been, so I'm really looking forward to tomorrow because um, I haven't been on a horse in five and a half months. So um, hopefully they're going to be well-behaved gentlemen. And nobody's going to be snotty. Um, I have a, a white, a, a gray, white stallion named Vinto de Broga. And I have a buckskin gelding named Donador. Um, and uh, they got in at early this morning and I, you know, have spent the day hanging out with them and getting my saddles arranged and doing all the stuff and tomorrow horses, you know, it's one of the things, a lot of writers, a mistake they make is they don't get enough physical activity. And I really think that having something you do, whether it's taking a long walk or skiing or canoeing or whatever it is, really, really helps. If you're stuck on a scene or you're stuck because you can't figure out the plot, go do something physical. And oftentimes you'll come back and you'll have the answer you need. And so that's sort of, you know, in addition to all the sort of niddly things about how to write, um, how to plot, how to, how to do those, reading your dialogue aloud, all the <clears throat> advice, excuse me, <clears throat> the advice I often give people, one of the things I say is work in some sort of physical activity, something that isn't you in your head you know, um, because that's really vital for writers to spend a few minutes, let, let the hind brain work, you know, by going and doing something else. Mm. 
Absolutely. And speaking of horses, one of the ideas I had for when Earth reopens and we're able to do these kind of things again, I haven't been on a horse in a long time. I, I was I did a little bit of horseback riding when I was much, 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 when I was a wee lad, uh, when I was much younger. But one of my ideas is I want to put on my costume because when I go to conventions, I cosplay as a famous archaeologist by the name of Indiana Jones. And oh. Indiana Jones has had his fair share of scenes where he's been on a horse. Mm -hmm. So I want to get on a horse, do a photo shoot, do some, get some pictures of me, you know, doing some horseback riding, maybe doing some, you know, you know, rolling on through. Maybe if there's a uh, tank chase going through the woods somewhere or whatever, I can just, you know, ride the horse and try to reenact some of those scenes from Last Crusade because that was my first Indiana Jones movie I watched as a wee lad growing up. And that's one of the reasons I'm an Indiana Jones fan. So that was, hopefully that'll happen. I, I hope I hope so, too. It depends on where you are. I uh, I couldn't put you on the stallion, but my gelding would probably be uh, amenable to, uh, <laughs> to, to having Indy ride him <laughs> at least for a little while. So... Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. I would love to have uh, that happen one of these days once the Earth is able to safely yeah. reopen, I should say, to be a little bit more specific. But yes, I, I am an Indiana Jones fan, grew up watching Last Crusade. Eventually I saw Raiders and the melting face scene is, um, that was a little haunting. <laughs> Temple of Doom is even scarier and I'm not even that big of a fan of that movie because to me Temple of Doom just, it never happened. Willie Scott, I'm looking at your character. You're very annoying. But anyhow, Next question I have for you. I'm sorry? It was, a, it was the second act in a three-act play, and it wasn't a very good one, you know. But uh, <sighs> I, do love, I, I do love the Indian, the three, three of them. I mean, and especially the first and the third were fantastic. So we will not say anything about the crystal skull. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. There's, there's a lot of people that just wipe that from their memory. It never happened. There's not a sequel to the third one that I know of. Yeah, it's but, like Buffy after the fifth season, you know, six and seven apocrypha. Sorry, you know, I love the first five seasons of Buffy. So, guess it never. I guess it never happened to a certain degree. It just never happened. Now, as we start to close things out here, one of the last questions I have for you: sci-fi movies. I gotta ask, what would you, what would, what would you say are your top five favorite? sci-fi movies of all time aliens mm -hmm. empire strikes back rogue one mm, god it's an old movie and it might not stand up that well but the day the earth stood still there's still a lot about that movie um gosh what would be my fifth Gonna go back to Star Wars again? Probably the very first Star Wars movie, you know, because um, uh, it, it got me through the bar exam. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would study all day, and and then I would go watch Star Wars, and it was the I think it's the only way I stayed sane. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, three of my top five are all Star Wars movies. Ooh, uh. <laughs> but there they are. That's aliens, okay. Aliens. That's okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. There's nothing wrong with that. But man, I don't think I've ever heard someone say, well, I watched this movie, you know, the Star Wars because it got me to the bar. That is a first for me. I have not heard that, but I love the story because that's, that is something, the... that is something else. Yeah. So. <laughs> that is something else. And I will say, I have been rewatching the Star Wars movies because, hey, it's the pandemic. What are you going to do? But yeah. there are some good, there are some good movies to rewatch and Star Wars, the original trilogy is not a bad choice whatsoever. Ever. So the more I watch A New Hope, the more I seem to enjoy it more and more as I watch it. I, there's just something about it, whether it's the characters, whether it's the score, because John, John Williams is the man. But I will say, every time Obi-Wan Kenobi makes his first appearance and we learn about him and he's teaching Luke the ways of the Force and saying, you got to learn the ways of the Force, Luke. You're meant for other things and all this other stuff is coming up. It's like Alec Guinness. Mwah. So good. So, so Good. I'm not going to lie. And may the force be with you all. For those of you who are watching us at home, whether it's live or through this replay, that is actually going to do it for this episode of the interview series with our guests this week, Melinda M. Snodgrass. Melinda, thank you so much for being here. Where can the fans follow you on social media to keep up with what you're doing as well as your projects? Okay. Um, I have a website, melindasnodgrass.com. Um, I'm on Facebook. Um, and I have a really fun crowd there. Um, we, we 
matter about horses and Star Trek and science and Star Wars and everything. Um, and um, I'm on Twitter, MM Snodgrass on Twitter. So uh, those are the major places. I'm not real good at Instagram because I'm a word person, not so much a picture person, but I do have an Instagram um, as well. So uh, I, you know, kind of you can't escape. I'm, I'm everywhere. Um, and, uh, and those are the major places. And then uh, my books are available on Amazon and other streaming services and more will be coming. So, you know, please, uh, Check them out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ryan of Neuroculture. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram as well as Facebook. Follow us on all our forms of social media at It's Neuroculture. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, do all that stuff. Check out our YouTube channel. Lots of videos are up right now. New ones are coming your way very soon. Also, check out our Redbubble. We have a store now, Redbubble. You can buy Neuroculture merchandise, whether it's T-shirts or tumblers, tapestry, laptop skins, hoodies we are in the fall season you if you want to get some new swagger we got plenty of it for you so check us out there and thank you all for joining us once again our guest melinda m snodgrass thank you so much for being with us in the meantime ladies and gentlemen enjoy the rest of your week watch movies and may the force be with you thank you very much everyone <laughs>